All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined from across the uh, country on the other coast from Spencer Wixom, who is in Greensboro, North Carolina, via Dallas, Texas. <laughs> Thank you, John. It's great to be here with you. Yeah, absolutely. And Spencer is the president and CEO of the Brooks Group. He spent the last 16 years of his career as a sales researcher, trainer, and sales executive, executive and has a passion for really understanding what makes sales professionals tick and moreover, what makes the best sales professionals tick. Uh, prior to the Brooks Group, uh, Spencer was a chief customer officer at Challenger, working for the corporate executive board and Gartner, where you learned the art of selling with careers in investment, banking, and real estate. And recently, you've been teaching as an adjunct professor at the University of Texas in Dallas. And today, Spencer, uh, we want to talk about that old chestnut sales process, right? <laughs> and I can already see, you know, there's some sales people go, oh, no, not the sales process thing. <laughs> uh, so why is it? Why, uh, let me just ask you a kind of fun, a foundational question here, Spencer. Yeah. Why? I mean, because your company does a lot of research. Why are we still talking about the import, not just the importance of having a sales process, but the importance of actually using a sales process? Yeah, so there's a there's a very uh, simple statistic to to indicate why that is the case. Um, so 95% of organizations that we survey and, and look at have a sales process. Almost everybody indicates, yes, we've got one. Mm -hmm. um, and we can probably articulate what its basic foundational steps are. But when you actually ask them, how many of them diligently or consistently adhere to that process, the number goes way, 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 way lower. That's somewhere around 20% mm -hmm. uh, of organizations. And so, um, yes, we, we have a process, but we're not following it. And when we don't follow it consistently, um, and I think this is particularly true right now, we tend to get lost, we tend to scramble, uh, we tend to be disorganized in the way we're engaging with customers mm -hmm. and handling some of those really critical elements of the sales, like the sales experience that they're having with us. Yeah, no, no, I would agree with you. And then, of course, then you get the you get the problem of you could have two salespeople, two identical opportunities, and one is in stage two and the other one's in stage three, and and it's like. Okay, which is which, and it's inf it's it's inflating or deflating your pipeline. It's in the wrong place. They're not qualified properly. People are doing things differently. A lot of this lands at the feet of of leadership, though. Correct? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Being disciplined enough to um, kind of expect that adherence uh, to the process. There's three really basic rules for for process adherence. I don't think process adherence is as difficult, perhaps, <laughs> as people make it out to be. Um, and I want to touch on uh, another element of process adherence in just a moment that'll sure. um, make it clearer. But, uh, you know, our founder uh, of the Brooks Group, Bill Brooks, had three basic rules for process adherence. And I think they're they're really good rules to follow, which is number one, don't skip steps <laughs> in a process. If you have a process that is easy to or makes some sense occasionally to skip steps, it's probably not a good process to follow. Right. Number two is don't move on to your next step until you've completed the previous step. Uh, and I think that's really important too, as you had mentioned just a second ago, when you're trying to track customer buying behavior, mm -hmm. which again, customers aren't going to adhere to your process, right? right? Your process should be designed around supporting the customer in uh, his or her buying journey. Um, but you don't want to move forward in those process steps until you've confirmed completion of the previous previous step. And number three is make sure you and the customer are in the same step at the same time. And that goes mm -hmm. back to what I was saying before, right? If your customer is on or is reacting to or appearing to be in what would correlate to step two and you're forward in step five, you're going to have a problem. You're going to be you know, forecasting that deal incorrectly. You're going to be confusing that customer in your communication. So there's all kinds of problems there. So don't skip steps, complete steps, be in the same step as the customer at the same time. 
Uh, and obviously to do that, it means that your sales process has to be defined, not just because I think a lot of times you have this kind of horizontal definition, you have st stage one, two, three, blah, blah, but there's not enough definition within those stages. What are the things that need to happen? And therefore it kind of leaves it a little bit open to interpretation. Exactly. Like there, there's a key to um, sales process simplicity that I think we want to think about. Yeah. And simplicity is the key word there. And you know, there's an interesting principle in design called affordance. And what affordance basically means, the great definition of affordance uh, by Donald Norman is action possibilities readily perceived by the actor. Mm -hmm. A simple example of that is I go to pick up a coffee mug. I naturally know to pick up that coffee mug by its handle. That handle has been def designed with affordance. Like it's, it's just intuitive. It's clear to right. me how to in interact with that mug. Same thing with a doorknob, right? I know naturally how to turn a doorknob to open a door. And I think sometimes we put too much um, kind of cute design into our sales process. So having it, you know, um, use certain terminology or the process, we try to put everything into it, including the kitchen sink, right? All of these definitions and details, and things like that. And it loses its affordance. It loses its kind of the natural inclination that a salesperson has, it doesn't connect well with that. And yeah. so in those instances, what happens? Well, you've either got to like ram people or force people into process adherence, which we all know doesn't work. Um, and, and so it, it breaks down that, that the process needs to be intuitive, simple, clear, have some affordance to it. And there's a, and there's another thing I think about sales process that um, you know I've always uh, seen, and that is, and this goes back to kind of to sales managers and sales leaders a lot of times is, uh, number one, salespeople are often very tempted to move things through the early stages quickly because they're excited, maybe they got happy ears, maybe they're hearing things that aren't there, and sales sales leaders and sales managers are more inclined to jump in at the end of the sales process when it gets to the later stages you know the super closer i'll help you get it over the line so they almost ignore that initial qualification and then of course you jump in at the end it all goes wrong and you can track it back to the fact that the, this the process wasn't followed early on the qualification wasn't done properly and now both the salesperson and sales leader are frustrated because they're everything got focused on the end and it all fell apart. Yeah, and it's it's not a, a really as I've watched sales process adherence or or activity over mm -hmm. the years. It's not a straight linear yeah. um, kind of progression. It's kind of like what I'm trying to remember who it was that said of societies that they fall slowly and then all at once. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a similar thing. I think if you look at your process and it's not overweighted to those yep. initial steps, to those investigation, initial meeting, discovery, probing steps, if you're not overweighted there, um, then I think you're, you're going to have real struggles in the back end yep. of your process. If you're rushing through to negotiation, confirmation, close, you're going to be very surprised that you don't have customers tracking with you on that process. And so, you know, a balance that we look at is the first couple of steps of that process and your initial investigation, your um, prospecting, and then your discovery should be about 70% of your time and effort. That yeah. back end should be 30% of your effort. And that back end is the effectiveness of that back end is heavily weighted on the effectiveness of the front end. Yeah. And, and like I said, I mean, that's where a lot of sales leaders or, or sales managers, they don't spend enough time with their salespeople in the in the early stages. Uh, you know, they kind of leave a lot of that up to them. And that's really where, as you said, it needs a lot of the attention needs to be. Because the other thing you end up with then is this inflated pipeline, right? Because you've got because we have a tendency to load stuff into the beginning. Uh, but, you know, back when I was uh, working at Huthway, like our parent company, Informer, we decided to go through this process of cleaning out our pipeline and going, okay, only things that are really we have a chance of a, a, a better than average chance or that the right fit, we cleaned it. And the first thing the parent company came back and said is, well, your pipeline is a quarter of what it was this time last year. And I said, <laughs> yeah, but our forecast is actually higher. <laughs> Yeah, you know, Anthony Inarino talks a lot about that when he says, you know, he's worked with organizations that demand some 
it's insane multiple yeah. of the closed pipeline, right? Well, we we want four or eight X. And he's like, well, that means you are planning to fail a vast majority of the time. Like <laughs> yeah. what kind of, of process is that? And I agree with you. I think if if the process is well set up, yes, you will probably have, you know, low yield rates in your in your front end, but your back end should be highly predictable yeah. Yeah. over time. I mean, it, we're talking 80 plus, 90 plus percent predictable on the back end, if you, and like you said before, if you have managers who are pushing for adherence, they're, they're saying basically slow down as opposed yeah. to speed up in those initial stages of the yeah. process. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's like slow down to hurry up because that's at the end of the day, if you, if you spend the time. And, and then the other thing I think uh, Spencer is you see a lot of companies, they may put a lot of work into their sales process initially, and then they think, good, sales process is sorted. That'll do us for the next couple of years. And we do. And meanwhile, your buyer behavior is changing. Maybe the market dynamics are changing, all of this. So I think sometimes people overlook that a sales process is kind of a living, breathing thing that you should be looking at and revisiting and tweaking as you go. Oh, absolutely. Well, think about it like jazz music. It seems like in my life, I'm, I'm, I love jazz music and used to play it. And I think I use jazz music as an analogy for about everything, but I think it works in this instance though here, which is, um, you know, jazz musicians get up on stage and they have a series of chord progressions. Well, they don't mm. play those chord progressions. They improvise on top of those chord progressions. And so their, their performance is different for each and every audience. And that allows them that artistic expression in the moment. But the one thing that they don't do is break the chord progressions. Right. If the chord yeah. progression is a key of C, they're not in a key of E. That's going to sound bad. It's going to sound mm -hmm. wrong. And that's, I think, the same principle applies to a sales process. The process is the chord progressions. It's the it's the structural ideas or or philosophy. I, there is a difference, too, between philosophy or excuse me, methodology and process. And I think sometimes sure. people confuse that mm -hmm. terminology. Methodology is what we want to accomplish. Like what is the sort of the spirit or the idea of our commercial activity? The process is the how you execute that. So, mm -hmm. you know, you have your process set up, but that process, if it's elegant, should allow for improvisation, um, for, like you said, innovation. What you don't want to be doing is breaking the structure or, mm -hmm. you know, you want to play within uh, the rules, so to speak. Yeah, and it's and it just to just to follow on what you're saying there, like it's interesting. You can you can understand the process. You can even be good at adhering to the process, but that doesn't mean that you also have the the right skills to move a you know move a customer through that process. So, talk to me a little bit about how this how the skill sets. Are, are really important for a sales process, like for your for your pipeline, for executing. You have to have the skills as well as adhering to the process. Well, you do. And the, and the skills are what uh, deepen each of those, yeah. those steps in the process. Here's an interesting thing we've been doing for a number of years. And we do this with a few thousand salespeople every year. So we've designed, uh, call it an assessment, a diagnostic, a test. We call it our selling skills uh, index. And what it does is it tests situational acumen by a salesperson in each of the kind of common stages of a sales process. Mm -hmm. So can I make the right decisions to do the right things in each of those uh, situations? What that allows us to do is it allows us to evaluate how uh, sharp or um, kind of how good the intuition is of, of salespeople in each of those steps. And what's interesting is we aggregate that data is we can see at large where salespeople struggle and, and where they don't. Um, one area that we've seen almost universally, every kind of group that we look at from military recruiters to <laughs> technology salespeople, to healthcare salespeople, to industrial machinery salespeople, from sales leaders down to individual sellers, the thing where they struggle most is in discovery, probing, critical questioning, that step. That's where the acumen appears to us to be weakest. And isn't it interesting that, as I said, here we are in 2023 and we're still having problems with people having good questioning skills 
and listening skills and uh, you know processing skills and being able to build on things because you know we we and I think part of it is because we're living in this crazy world where number one we think we have we already think we have the answers to everything yeah. and we think they're at our fingertips we have bad attention spans we're distracted we're not focused because let's face it a, a salesperson who is really focused who's really asking good as you said probing questions who's making you as a buyer think a little differently those really stand they stand out way more than they should well yeah and think about think about the different economic environment that we're in now mm -hmm. compared to where we were say five years ago five years ago there was equity money and there was debt money flowing yeah. into business right and so what was your decision when you had that money and you said well there's people who have given me this money yeah. With the expectation that I grow the business to repay the debt or with the expectation that I grow the business to give them an equity return. And so I've got to spend this money to begin proving to them that I'm a good steward of it. Mm -hmm. And so that creates a ton of business for salespeople to react to, which is you've got buyers who are under pressure to spend money. What a great environment to be in, right? <laughs> And so you don't really need to probe particularly deeply as far as their motivations or what they want to accomplish and things. They're standing there going, you have stuff to sell. I have money to buy stuff. Tell me you know, what it is you've got to sell. Now we've got an, uh, an environment in which people are looking at it and they say, we have, we have to be very careful about how we spend our operating cash flow because that's mm -hmm. what we've got. So we're making very critical concerned decisions Will the things we buy support what it is that we want to do? That's the kind, that's why our questioning needs to be so much deeper and more powerful and more deliberate now is because we've got to uncover that so that we can know how to position our solution to capture those rare dollars. Yeah. And and I think the other part of it is when you get into a, 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 a situation like this, and it happened, all, it happened, obviously, it's happened recently, but it happened after the financial crisis as well back in 2008, is that, as you said, you know, people are very careful about their dollars and all of that. But your biggest competitor can turn out to be the no decision because that's the easiest one to make. That's the one that it's it's it appears safe on the surface and you're you've no risk of somebody coming back and say, what happened? You know, that was a waste of money. Uh, and so that becomes that becomes even harder because it's not even that you're trying to compete with other competitors. You're trying to compete with the with the, you know, the inclination to play safe. Right. The uncertainty that taking an action with mm -hmm. you will be a good thing for me, mm -hmm. right? And whereas we we think, like you said, and that's, a, I think it's a very good point. We think we're comp they're going to do something because for a number of years they did. They yep. took those actions. Now it's just, you know, I want to make sure each action independently, I have a sufficient degree of certainty that's going to be a good action or I'm not going to do it. So we really have to think deeply about uh competing against that, like you said. Yeah. And I guess the the other thing that I, I think really stands out nowadays is the, the best the best salespeople, because the best process in the world won't cure this, but the best salespeople are the ones who actually have some real level of, of curiosity, intellectual curiosity, like curiosity about the business of their prospect, curiosity about the the business of business in in general, because once upon a time, I think you could skate by. A lot of salespeople could skate by without really understanding how business worked. I used to have one salesperson in a different company who used to say, "Oh, John, I sell the sizzle, not the steak," <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just not sure you can sell sizzle these days, to be honest. No, no. well, you can. I mean, sizzle helps to sell steak. Sure. But you're selling steak at the end of the yeah. day, for sure. Well, I, and John, I think you bring up an interesting point there, which is just to kind of put a frame on what we've been talking about. Yeah. Process, adherence to a process, simplification of the process so that it has affordance, that people follow it. That's important, right? But then having the, the skills beyond the process to be able to innovate on it, to improvise mm -hmm. around it, all of that, very important as well. The third piece, I think, which you just touched on is I've got to have a proper mindset. I've got to have a proper set of personal skills mm -hmm. to guide me. And, and one of the things we're concerned about is we are seeing an atrophy of a full host of personal skills yeah. in the current environment. Now that could be generational. We're getting a mm -hmm. lot of new inexperienced salespeople in, in Gen Z and, and younger millennials. It could be the pandemic throwing people off their game. It could be just the fact that we've never encountered an economic environment. Many in their sales careers have never encountered an economic environment that's yeah. 
challenging. All of those things combined to really chip away at that, like you said, that confidence, that personal skill set. I think organizations, it's very important for them not only to look at, do you have the selling acumen? Do you also have that proper set of deeper personal skills? Curiosity, you mentioned being one, uh, problem solving, flexibility, conflict management, resiliency, all of those to be able to properly do the job. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And the uh, and just and the basic listening skills, because that's something that people have lost uh, a lot of and you see it. And, and yeah, I mean, it could be a generational thing, but it's afflicted. Uh, it's across all generations because these stupid things have uh, have become <laughs> so, uh, you know, they, be, they control our lives so much. I mean, how many times have you been in a conversation with somebody and their phone buzzes and they immediately look down to check it and then kind of come back to the conversation and you go, well, that's a bit rude. Yeah. But, it, but it's almost become acceptable. So therefore, if you're having a sales conversation, it's very easy to let your mind wander, or get distracted because you're not because people aren't disciplining themselves to say, no, no, no. My focus needs to be 150 percent needs to be on Spencer right now. Yeah, we're I think we're we're doing a lot more analyzing of the game these days and less playing of the game. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and we got we got to get in the game. It's really interesting when you look at disc profiles in the last few years, what you see is you see on like if you look at a meta analysis of it, you see influence going down and you see compliance going up. What does mm. that say? Right. We're analyzing the game. We're evaluating. We're trying to pull the levers from behind. We got to be jumping back into it. We've got to yeah. be persuading human to human, face to face. Yeah, that's yeah, no, absolutely. I'm sure we're seeing intuition go down as well because that was always good. And like, you know, intu if you did not this, but what's it, Briggs Myers intuition is always a, that's always, if you see that, that's always a good thing in a salesperson because they're reading things all the time. So you're probably going to see the same on that, uh, on those profiles too. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. Well, listen, Spencer, this has been great. Uh, all of Spencer's information will be below this video. But before you go, please do tell us a little bit more about the Brooks Group. Sure. The Brooks Group has been around for 40 years. We're a boutique sales training, transformation, coaching and, and assessment organization. Uh, we serve organizations across all different kinds of industries. Um, and uh, we really care deeply about understanding, as I said before, the process that salespeople follow, the skills by which they execute that process, and the mindset they bring to the job. We feel all of those elements combined and strengthening those elements leads to much stronger performance in the organizations we work with. Absolutely. And by the way, uh, if people always think, oh, oh well, I'm going to I'll invest in my sales team, but they always think about I'll do that when the times are good and I've got extra money. And when times are bad, I'll just wing it. This is actually when times are tough. This is the time you uh, the people who actually invest in in skills development during the tough times are the people who always emerge the strongest. That's a, that's a well known. If you want to look that up, that's statistically proven. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, listen, thanks again, Spencer. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again soon. Thank Great you. pleasure, John. Thank you.